Aloha, I'm Malia Zimmerman. Today we're going to talk about the rail project. Should it be built? And what is the status of the lawsuit against the rail project in general? Uh, today I have two experts with me, Panos Prevadoras, who's a University of Hawaii professor, and also from the University of Hawaii, Randall Roth, who's a law professor. I don't think we could get two people that uh, could talk about this project better than, than the two of you. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Pados, I know you have a lot of expertise um, in transportation and you do all kinds of studies and you've, you have an amazing record of working around the world on transportation issues. But maybe you can fill in for people who are, have not paid any attention to this issue at all about this rail project. What is the rail project and uh, what are some of the highlights about some of the concerns? Well, it is the, the third time we're trying this one, and it's the biggest uh, of them all. The original design was for 34 miles. Now, what is on the table is a 20-mile segment from outside Kapolei to downtown Ala Moana Center. Uh, the project has been making reasonable progress, we should say, in the paperwork stage. And uh, in the very early in January, I believe, 2010, they received what is called the record on decision, which essentially close what is called the environmental process. That also started the clock for any disputes of the process, and Randy will talk about that. Uh, all along the way, quite a few experts of us locally have been against it because it's simply too big, too ugly, too expensive, and really, in the definition of the project, it does not address the main requirement, which is congestion reduction. Yes, it reduces it by a little bit, but this little bit, one, two, or three percent, for five to six billion dollars, really does make no sense. So we're talking about 5.3 billion and it could go up. I mean, that's just the 5.3 billion is what the city is saying that it'll cost. Mm -hmm. And we always know about our government projects, they seem to run over. Um, and um, we're, you know, we went through the environmental impact statement mm -hmm. uh, process. And, and uh, Randy, you've been part of a group um, you've been called a gang by the mayor um, in terms of uh, coming to challenge whether or not the city has actually done a good job on the environmental impact statement. Is it an, uh, is it an adequate job? Have they really explored all the alternatives besides steel on steel elevated rail system, which I think a lot of people don't realize this is not a ground level necessarily the right. whole way. It's not a light rail. This is a heavy steel on steel rail with eight foot wide support system from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your, why, why are you challenging this? Well, I'm one of a number of plaintiffs, as you mentioned, and we are alleging that the city violated um, a number of federal laws. Uh, perhaps the easiest to understand is that the federal law requires the city to go through what's called an alternative study, where any technology, any route, any approach that is reasonable and feasible needs to be investigated in some detail so that when the final decision is made, it can be made among those approaches that, that can make some sense. Uh, we believe the record is really pretty clear uh, that the city didn't do that, uh, that the city had pretty much decided it wanted elevated heavy rail from the very beginning. Uh, we have some quotes from uh, Mayor Hanneman so shortly after he was elected, basically saying that bus rapid transit, for example, was uh, Harris's thing and that his administration was simply not going to be considering it. Uh, if we take him at his word, that is pretty much an admission uh, that they didn't do what federal law requires in the way of an alternatives analysis. So we're looking at some of the most powerful people in Hawaii have come out to support this. I mean, and uh, I think Rick Amata on KTH Radio this morning was saying it's like going upstream to try to fight this project because you have Senator Inouye who's promising all this money. I think he promised $1.5 uh, billion mm -hmm. uh, out of the $5.3 billion. Um, we have, uh, you know, the governor, this current governor, Abercrombie, uh, who's, who's backed it from the beginning. We have the two mayors. We've had Mayor Hanneman, Mayor Carlisle, who ha are passionately for it. The, the, the uh, council, the city council has always had at least one person over the amount it needs out of the nine to, to get everything through, whether it's mm -hmm. five and sometimes it's six and seven um, without very many questions except for from a handful of uh, council members challenging this. And, and it seems like the big business the big government, they're in lockstep for this project. So, so Randy, why, why, would you, why would you go against that? I mean, I know you've gone uh, up against uh, some powerful forces before, but you've, got a, you know, you've, you've written Broken Trust, uh, the book, with Sam King. Well, I, I feel strongly about rule of law, and I mm -hmm. think that um, you know, sometimes there are laws that we don't believe in, so we try to change them. But when you have a law, and in my opinion, the city simply uh, flaunts the law, just violates it, um, 
uh, that can't be simply disregarded. I think somebody needs to do something on that front. But to be honest, what got me personally involved in this uh, wasn't so much that I thought rail was a terrible idea, although I think it does. This particular proposal, I think, makes no sense whatsoever for the city of Honolulu. What really bothered me was the uh, deception uh, that the city used in, in selling the public on the notion of elevated heavy rail. Uh, just right down the line, whether it's ridership forecasts or cost forecasts, or the way they described it as environmentally friendly, which, which would be humorous if the subject weren't so serious. Um, right down the list, they gave people the impression that, that this was about traffic congestion, that, that we want to relieve the current level of traffic congestion. And yet, in the fine print that they weren't mentioning to the public, they've acknowledged that, that traffic in the future is going to be worse with rail than what it is right now. It's going to be better, would be better, than if we did absolutely nothing, but that's a false choice. Nobody's for doing absolutely nothing. And so when you look at the alternatives, uh, elevated heavy rail is, is just way more expensive than what is required. It doesn't addra address what I consider a very serious traffic congestion problem. It's built upon a foundation of, of extremely misleading, and I'm being generous in calling it misleading, uh, positions that the, the city has taken. So more than anything, the deception. Let me give you one specific example. Uh, Mayor Hanneman and, and Me Too Mayor uh, Carlisle has, has simply said yes to everything that Hanneman had initially done, was promising somewhere between 10,000 and 17,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, there's modeling programs that you use and you point to, garbage in, garbage out. What, what he didn't tell the public was that that doesn't identify where the jobs are going to be created. And a lot of the jobs on this proposal would be outside Hawaii. But even more troubling to me is that when you're taking about $4 billion out of the private economy through taxes, that has an adverse effect on jobs. So you can't just look at what's spending $5 billion does in the way of jobs, you've got to look at the net effect. Uh, a month ago when the national economy uh, had no new net job creation, there were a lot of new jobs but an equal number of jobs lost, well the Obama administration appropriately acknowledged that all that matters is the net number and it was zero. Well the city is doing the exact opposite. The city is saying, hey, never mind where they're going to be, look at all these jobs that get created when you spend five billion dollars. It's just so dishonest that if it were being done in the private sector by some company that was trying to attract investors or to borrow money from the bank, if they didn't have the kinds of disclosures that the city is not making, they could go to jail, it could be securities fraud. And so it was the um, deception that really got me personally riled up and, and wanting to be a part of the group of plaintiffs. Pottles, what about you? What do you think are the biggest, you talk about deception or, or um, you know, what's coming out of the city in terms of what they're saying the rail's going to do. What, what's your biggest issue with it? Actually, the word is the most appropriate deception, even in engineering terms. In fact, there is a professor at Oxford University who talks about mega projects, and he ranks rail systems as the highest in deception. Basically, most rail projects have been inflicted on various populations by deceiving them about their advantages. Uh, environmental advantages are minimized. Um, the noise, the pollution, the energy components, all of them are minimized or are presented in very rosy pictures while the project really does not work. And time and again, rail systems, unfortunately, have been quite disappointing in terms of the numbers they generate. Uh, you think that you build it and they will come. You build it at a huge expense, much more than you expect, and they don't come. Uh, one of the primary cases, and it's an excellent side-by-side -side comparison for us, is San Juan, Puerto Rico, which is an island, and they build heavy rail, and they have the same consultant, Parsons Brigerhoff, and the same oversight, the Federal Transit Administration. So basically, their costs doubled, doubled, and their ridership never materialized, never. Because this system has been out now for about seven years. Um, the consultant guessed, I guess, and FDA approved 80,000 people in the opening year. They got 25,000 riders. 
after seven years in operation, they haven't even reached the midpoint of 40,000. So again, I mean, these systems really have absolutely no payoff, not now, not for future generations. They're black holes of taxpayer money. They're unproductive investments. And speaking of which, we are not even in an era of fast growth, economic growth, so you have surpluses and all, just sink it over there, make jobs or what have you, whatever political excuse you want to use. We are in a city that has huge problems in infrastructure. We are operating under a consent decree for secondary sewage treatment by various estimates. This is somewhere between three and five billion all by itself. So, well, if we want local jobs, that's what it is. Uh, we have pavements in very bad condition. We have a lot of work we need to be doing with airports and, and harbors, etc. So the infrastructure projects are out there. We are a very small taxpaying population, roughly 400,000 taxpayers in the whole of Hawaii. So where is this mega project is coming? And it is really a bad deal, even if you look at it from a financial perspective. The feds are covering somewhere between 20 and 25 percent, depending what the cost overrun is going to be, because the feds are not going to be part of any overrun. They're giving you 1.5. If the, if the cost is 5 billion, fine. If it goes, say, to 10 billion, it's still 1.5. You got to if pay it's all even going to be 1.5, because at this point, there's that, no oh, funding allocated at all absolutely. in the that, future yes. that we've seen. Liet, um, Panos brings up the subject of Parsons Brinkerhoff. Mm -hmm. And one of the courses I teach at the law school gets into conflicts of interest and, mm -hmm. and all of the reasons why we need to be particularly sensitive when there's a conflict of interest. <laughs> Nobody at the city has any background, training, or experience, expertise in heavy rail. Mm -hmm. So the city is totally dependent upon its consultant, Parsons Brinkerhoff. Parsons Brinkerhoff already has contracts for providing consulting services in excess of $400 million. That's, that's a big number, let me repeat it, $400 million. million. They have a strong self-interest in seeing that heavy rail actually gets done. Who do you suppose the city hired to be its, its chief staff person involved in this rail project, a Parsons Brinkerhoff executive, who happens to be married to another Parsons Brinkerhoff executive? Who do you suppose they retain to provide oversight over Parsons Brinkerhoff? Well, a new company made up of three Parsons Brinkerhoff <laughs> former executives. Yes. There's a, a, a tangled web of relationships that we would describe as a conflict of interest. It doesn't mean that they've done anything wrong but it means that we need to be doubly sensitive to just what's going on. And so, for example, when the initial route was designed too close to Honolulu Airport, it got into the federal airspace and, and had to be moved. The federal government has said the cost of moving it is a minimum $65 million. Uh, the former Parsons Brinkerhoff fellow at the city said, well, no, we can do it for $29 million and said, don't worry, the taxpayers can afford it. Now, he said it a little differently, he said, we've got contingency money, but that's another way of saying the taxpayers will pay for it. I've asked, if you're paying over $400 million to a consultant, wouldn't you expect them to know about a law protecting airspace over an airport? And if the route was wrong initially and has to be changed at a cost of $29 million, $65 million, whatever, why wouldn't the assumption be that your consultant should pay for that. Why shouldn't there be a transparent public process of sorting out just what happened and who should be responsible, and yet nothing except the city statement through the former Parsons Brinkerhoff executive that the city, the taxpayers, will pay for it. There are just so many things like that with this particular proposal that are phenomenally troubling that the more you look at it, the more upsetting it is, and I believe that once the public realizes the, the extent to which they've been misled on all of this and the extent to which the city is totally reliant upon a group that has a strong self-interest in pushing this thing through, I think the public's going to make clear that they just don't want this nonsense to continue. Now, there's some very interesting people involved in the lawsuit on your side. And, Podnos, you're not involved in the lawsuit, just to be clear. Right. Right. But um, can you give us a little background uh, briefly about some of the people that have stepped up to um, basically fund and be a part of as plaintiffs in this lawsuit? Well, uh, normally environmental organizations like rail, uh, this particular elevated heavy rail proposal 
uh, is disliked by almost every relevant environmental group in, in the state. In fact, several of the plaintiffs in our law firms are, are prominent, long-term, very highly regarded environmental organization. Uh, Life of the Land, Hawaii's Thousand Friends, uh, the League of Women Voters voted to, to join us to be a, a plaintiff. So we've got some, some very solid um, organizational citizens, if you will. Um, Cliff Slater, the so-called Gang of Four uh, that I'm a part of, who have done some writing and some speaking lately, uh, Cliff Slater has been fighting heavy rail for a long time and is extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he founded Maui Divers Jewelry Company about 50 years ago. He's their CEO right now. Um, without any compensation whatsoever, has been working on this for a long, long time. Ben Cayetano, former governor of the state, uh, Walter Heen, former judge, former city councilman chairman, former legislator, former U.S. attorney, former OHA trustee, former Democratic Party chairman, uh, and Walter was one of my compatriots on the Broken Trust activities. Um, the four of us, so-called Gang of Four, uh, an interesting combination of people. It is, uh, the right. four of us have very different backgrounds so far as our, our political uh, orientation or involvement uh, has been, uh, but we really enjoy working with each other and we're just solid as a rock in our opposition to this proposed elevated heavy rail system and our belief that the city has been very deceptive in all of this. And then there are some other um, plaintiffs, Sam Sloan, uh, Senator is, is involved and um, you know without getting into to all of the individuals involved, um, we're, we're doing our best to um, to stop this, this rail project and, and not so we have nothing, but so that we can have a real alternative study and, and we can find an affordable, uh, environmentally friendly public transportation and traffic solution approach that, that really makes sense. Finally, you were asking, you know, how can we afford this, um, uh, this lawsuit because it's it's really very expensive. <laughs> we have, and you're not getting funded by we, city taxpayers. We and, and see, my expertise is not environmental law and Governor Cayetano's is not environmental law and Walter Haynes, Judge Haynes is not environmental law. So we've actually hired the fellow that we consider the top environmental law person in the country. Uh, he headed up the team that wrote the regulations that are right at the center of, of what we're alleging. Uh, last year, the American Bar Association named him the outstanding environmental law person on practice and policy. Uh, he's really very good, but not cheap. And what we've done is, is ask other people who believe that, that rail is a bad idea, who, like me, are upset at the deceptive way the city has, has sold all of this, uh, to help us to make contributions, for example, to uh, Hawaii's Thousand Friends, which is one of the plaintiffs, or contributions to the S SBA, um, SBH Foundation, SBH right? Foundation right, right. Uh, Educational Fund, uh, to, which, which is another of the, the plaintiffs. Right. So these are, are tax deductible contributions that can enable us to see this lawsuit to a conclusion. Um, you never know what's going to happen when you get into a courtroom. Uh, but I started off very optimistic about our chances, and I've gotten even more optimistic as we've seen what the city's responses to our, our complaints have been. Uh, our lawyers been optimistic. If, if we can raise the money to see this to a conclusion, um, I'm really feeling quite confident that we're going to prevail. Good. Well, we'll bring that up again at the end of the show. But I'm curious, but, though. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. how do you think this process will play out, at least time-wise? Mm -hmm. Well, it's possible that the city will attempt to, to stretch it out. Um, we didn't think so initially. They recently filed a motion that to us is, is frivolous, except that it stalls things a bit. But we think there's a good chance that the judge could actually decide this by the end of the year, but that probably it'll be decided sometime in, in early 2012. We think by the summer of 2012 at, at the very latest. So we're, we're really pretty optimistic about that. So, Panos, one of the issues is that the city's already starting with these contracts. And, you mm -hmm. know, the more money they spend on consultants, on archaeological studies, which they're starting now digging up bones or looking for bones with their fancy machine, mm -hmm. the more they do, do you think the more hesitant people will be to say, let's kill this project because we've already spent so much money? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Actually, some of what they are doing is absolutely required as part of what is called the final design. See, the city is not ready to build it. Uh, they may lie or misrepresent the fact that, you know, uh, rail is a done deal and is getting built. They have what is called pre-construction authority, so you can start removing utility. 
utilities, but then for the final design, they need to take extensive geotechnical samples to do the foundations. That's a big part of the design. Okay, but then we had a brand new issue that came up in the programmatic agreement, cultural sites or sites of historical significance. So they have to do an extended and expensive survey. And yesterday was broken in the news that it'll start closing lanes throughout, you know, Alamona Boulevard, Queen Street, uh, Dillingham Boulevard, of course, and all. And all this will have a significant effect. And in fact, it is a blessing that these things are happening. They are necessary to, to have these surveys. And then people will begin to realize what small lane closures are for this town and when and if the project goes into real construction, trying to put football-sized stations on major highways, such as Farrington, Kamehameha, Dillingham, and downtown, I mean, the impact would be tremendous. You know, Leah mm -hmm. Panos mentions football-sized stadiums. I happen to have brought a, a oh, rendering. Oh, yes, show us this picture before um, we forget. You know, the, the renderings that the city has, has produced through Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, make the railway and the stations look almost pastoral. It, it just designed They're beautiful. It, They're, it just it, it looks, yeah. looks so, so quaint. Right. Um, the architects here in Honolulu, the AIA, um, are very much opposed to elevated heavy rail. And they did some renderings that, unlike the cities, uh, meet the specifications of what this thing would actually look like. So you're actually like. showing it. And it's even got graffiti on it, because we know it will have graffiti when it's done. It, <laughs> it, it, it absolutely will. And, and this is according to specifications. This is, is right down Ala Moana uh, Boulevard. It's there on, on Nimitz, actually, with the uh, Dillingham Transportation Building right next door there. That's a four-story building. The station would be six stories high. So in addition to all of the things that Panas and I have been talking about in terms of why this is a terrible idea, it's ugly. Mm -hmm. And that would be bad uh, anywhere, Nebraska, Kansas, anywhere. But this is Hawaii. The, the core of our economy has to do with people wanting to come here, this sense of place, uh, feeling like this is a spe special place. And, and this looks almost like your downtown Chicago, you know, listening to the L as it rumbles by. It just doesn't belong here. So for all of the other reasons, yes, let's get rid of it. But it's also ugly, and it destroys the view planes, uh, Malka and Mackay, all along um, the waterfront. Well, I know one of the issues was co going through downtown and Chinatown and the historic district. And I was just in Chicago on the L mm -hmm. and seeing how rusty it was. It looked like our big our Aloha Stadium you know, spread across uh, Chicago, very rusty and uh, falling apart. But uh, one of there is a similar comparison with the Miami system, which is about okay. 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have this kind of layout with square, with ugly concrete. But because of the tropical environment, what happens to concrete, particularly underneath, it gets moldy. Oh. And that's really pretty um, unappealing looking. But for the picture that Randy uh, brought, there mm -hmm. is a different version of it from Honolulu Magazine. And I use it actually in my class to sensitize engineers about environmental impact is not only what you destroy, but I try to tell them, try think now, 20 years down the road, you will take your son or daughter to show them the Dillingham Transportation Building, and you will not be able to take a clear picture of it. Mm -hmm. It's all blighted by the, you know, the overstructure and the, and the big columns. So that's part of the impact that needs to be accounted every time we build something big. And the city has not been transparent about it. Mm -hmm. You had to have opposition to actually tell the community that, you know, well, you like it or not, but this is a more realistic picture of it and what's the aesthetics of, of the project. And Malia, some people have, have been critical of the so-called Gang of Four saying that we're, we're just against rail and it's easy to be against something, but, but we need to be for something. Well, there, there are a lot of traffic congestion solutions. I, I, I'm a big believer in public transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I met on a city bus 38 years ago. We mm -hmm. were both uh, bus riders. And, and there are just so many things that you really can do if you want to relieve traffic congestion. The hot lanes that I know Panos has mm -hmm. talked and, and written about a great deal. There, personally, I'd like to just do away with the cost of riding the bus. I think anybody can ride the bus at any time, not buy a pass, not pay anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you're talking about not spending five plus billion dollars on rail, you can afford to, do, afford to do some, some really right. innovative things. Yeah, right. And that's just the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think the city has stacked the deck in the sense that, that they really haven't made much of an attempt 
to help with the traffic situation in and outside of town. And I think if we finally got this blankety-blank rail proposal out of the way, there are just a lot of things that we could do that would really reduce traffic congestion, that would protect the Very environment, much. would be less expensive. There are just a, a ton mm -hmm. of things. Um, but we first have to deal with the reality that this proposed rail system is going to happen unless this lawsuit is successful. And again, if people want to help ensure that we can see that to a conclusion. Um, you need they, funding. We need funding. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. pro we're professors. Right, yeah, I, know, right. I know, I so, know. You don't, you have, you know, not, the, not millions of dollars money, at your disposal. So, yeah, it's, uh, right. right. And speaking of the point that Randy just brought up, we definitely don't have time to talk about solutions. We've done a little bit We've in the past. We've done a lot we of shows on that, right. More, yeah, but we can do today, a big report came out about congestion in the United States. And in the conclusions of it, Honolulu is identified as one of six cities that will benefit by fixing the traffic lights. So for a city of its size, I read the sentence here, Honolulu and Richmond, Virginia, Virginia in the middle uh, population of about one million, they will benefit the most by fixing their traffic lights. Basically by doing the survey in Oryx of traffic congestion and all, they identify that we spend too much time bumper to bumper on our streets because we stop unnecessarily on red lights. Well, I know, We've I call on the Holy Highway, yeah. right. I mean, that's one of the main, yeah. simplest things you could do. You, you stop every single light, the mind, and yes. there's no one coming, and it doesn't make any sense. So that is absolutely, yeah. a, definitely so, a way. And also, you talked about some issues and challenges. We don't have much time, but sum up what you were thinking about that you want to mention on issues and challenges for the rail. Um, so in what respect? Have issues and challenges for... Um, What's coming up, I guess, for the rail? Like, what do you, what do you see happening next, I guess? Uh, well, first of all, they have to get the federal approval of the, of the fine. The, well, the big hurdle that the project needs to pass is the FFGA, full funding grant agreement. Mm -hmm. Until they get to that stage from the feds, they cannot get the promised big chunk of money. Once they reach that stage, the FTA might approve it. Then, along with the lawsuit, my big hope is also that Congress will say, well, simply we don't have the money. Honolulu, even, even if this was a deserving project and a good project and this and that, $1.5 billion, where we are in a cost-cutting kind of uh, situation. So, you know, we cannot afford this kind of money. So Congress is cutting is, anyway. Well, you're yeah. right. We, we couldn't afford it. But the city, I think, has signaled that they're going to go forward or they would want to go forward. They plan to go forward even if they don't get federal that's money. Terrible. And then who's I, left hanging the, uh, 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 paying I, for it, I, right? I the think tax that's rates. just insanity times two. Right. But I personally think it all comes down to this lawsuit. I think if we prevail, then rails off the table. Good. If we don't prevail, I fear the worst. Well, on that note, we're going to have to have another show because we have lots more to talk about. But this has been News Behind the News. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our guests for coming on to share their expertise. Aloha.